Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 479. That's 479 of the Agostino Zynga Show. I hope this is finding you well wherever you may be. If you're watching this via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. That would be greatly, greatly appreciated. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review and a share will help the show to spread and go a long way. As always, support via Patreon is welcome to at patreon.com for us. Agostino. I've got Patreon-only content behind a paywall, which is only $1, one pound per month. You get access to all my bonus content. I just uploaded a bonus episode recently talking about my after review of my first gig after everything, you know, the lockdown, all that stuff and nightlife and whatnot it goes into a bit more detail a bit more of a racier topics that i kind of wouldn't be able to speak about obviously on the main channel on the main podcast so if you want to see that sort of stuff jump on the patreon show notes the, the link is in the description wherever you're watching this wherever you're listening get involved on there today support the kids support the kid if you can boom so here we are back again i'm um you know here drinking very lukewarm um lemon water with ice that was previously had ice but over the span of what five minutes it's all melted very quickly because despite the lack of sunlight it's still very humid here in the uk which i'm not going to complain about because i'd much rather this kind of cold humid weather than the blaring sun that wasn't doing any of us any favors like i mentioned we're just not the country you know it's twofold because of covid we've had the practice of being able to go outdoors and kind of enjoy the outdoors and you know be free with parks and stuff and reconnect with the stuff around us we don't really take for granted because i think prior to covid people in the uk which is maybe makes sense because of the weather we tend to always go inside places like a lot of people who don't drink complain if they have to meet their friends they have to go to bars all the time because there is nothing else to do you just have to go to a bar or restaurant and that usually involves some kind of alcohol so now obviously with those establishments being closed for the majority of you know um this pandemic we've had to kind of figure out ways to make ourselves you know occupied and have a bit of fun and that meant going to parks and just hanging around whatever it may be so it's twofold in that respect when it's hot it means that we can enjoy the outside more but it also means if you're not an outdoors person and you're inside you're going to be feeling it because for the most part most buildings unless you're living in a very new um sort of like you know high-tech building that's fully kitted out and stuff air conditioning is really an afterthought ventilation is an afterthought having cool breeds is not the fault because think about it if you're an architect working in a building on in england one of the things you have to bear in mind is the weather right the weather is usually quite crappy it's usually raining it's usually wet it's usually cold it's usually windy usually foggy so you have to kind of bear those things in mind more so than if you may be building a an apartment complex in the middle of flipping thailand or something right the weather constraints will be a little bit different so it's i don't really blame the contractors or the architects for building these homes like this because part of the thing that makes it great is that in the winter times you don't have to put the heating on for most buildings it's fairly cool you can just put on a hoodie and you're all right whereas other kind of older buildings you might need to put the heating on because the walls are too th- mostly because the window panes are too thin but you know what can you do these are the small first world problems that we have to worry about over here in the uk but whatever let's just um get involved in the show loads of things to chat about loads of things to go into that i would like to chew your ear off on number one topic to get on obviously is an update on the Kanye West album which is hasn't come out obviously naturally as we all kind of half expected it feels like he's probably trolling us but I don't think that's the case I think if, if you know of Kanye and you're familiar with his story and you've been a fan of his for a long time you would know there's always these kind of last minute hiccups that happen throughout the duration of his kind of unconventional approach to making albums there's always some last minute changes um, always delays he kind of moves the beat of his own drum no record label was ever going to force him to drop on a certain date. He's one of the rare unicorns in the music industry who could take probably a 10-year break, come back and probably still be able to sell 300,000, 200,000 first week very easily. So because of that, he's very valuable to record labels and valued assets. They don't really try to pressure into doing things that they don't want to do because you want, especially with somebody who have his experience, who's that vocal, who's that, yeah, who's that vocal, who's, who's got the resource that he has. You don't want to create a stink around him because he eventually might end up get himself out of his contract and go into another competitor and no one wants that so even if even if the Kanye machine is a bit crazy you'd much rather have crazy coins and no coins so delay was to be expected but it's just annoying I think in terms of how we consume media 
and content nowadays. I just think people have less patience, and maybe because of his, you know, previous years dalliance with the far right and stuff, which I don't really have a problem with because again, I'm not American, so my politics. But it did seem a little bit annoying, regardless of what political party you're in, that he basically tried to purposely weaponize his fan base to um, go against the Democrats and stuff. It just seemed a little bit yucky, right? And it was all kind of um, self-serving. He threw his family under the bus, threw his kids under the bus. Like this did loads of really shitty things. I think made people dislike Kanye as a person for for the first time in a long time. I don't think people disliked him as a person overall. I think a lot of people kind of liked him as a person, kind of grew, grew to love him. He was kind of that annoying older brother that you kind of had. I don't know. People had a kind of love-hate relationship with him. And obviously, because of his artistic work, you know, there was no real debate on that thing. But it did seem to me like in recent years, for some odd reason, don't know why it happened, but in some way, shape or form, somehow the public consensus around Kim and Kanye completely flipped. Everyone kind of had a lot of time, a lot of sympathy for Kanye basically being married to this guy and having a family with him. And then they had less sympathy with Kanye and his supposed, you know, mental breakdowns and all this other stuff that was going on. I'm only saying supposed because I don't know anyone's medical deal because I don't believe it. You know, it's not my business to dig in deep into people's uh, medical, what you call it, conditions and whatnot. But still, um, I think that's basically added to the sentiment I'm feeling now where people are a bit more just pissed off. I think people expect when a date is announced and you say you're going to drop something, you just should drop it. I don't think people are entertaining Kanye anymore in that regard. He's kind of lost that sort of, um, what does he say? He's lost that. He's lost that, not reason that he's, he's lost that benefit of doubt kind of thing. If you think, if you get what I mean, but I also think he's, in a position now where he truly doesn't give a shit i think more so than before i think before it was more so a lot of posturing because he wasn't in a place financially because the first thing you have to realize too as being a big funny fans kind of fan myself in recent years the importance that he placed on money the importance he placed on infrastructure and having the right corporations behind him was very evident right very evident he kept on stressing that he needs the money he needs the infrastructure he needs the structure he needs all the procedures and people behind him to back him in order for him to actualize his dreams and i think a big example of that was when he went on the breakfast club and he had that big you know tete a tete with charlemagne the god and it was quite clear that he realized in his point of his career if he wanted to go to the next level he needed to have those um corporations that kind of make the machine run that are kind of integral to it that people don't really know the names of right all these people who are basically the king makers king and queen makers of each whatever scene wherever you may be in our industry and he knew that he needed those people on his side in order for him to get to the next level so he can you know, achieve billionaire status and make money and you know, just be basically printing money with Jesus with his easiest at the moment and now he's got to that level it feels like he's truly not giving a shit and that might be the reason why artistically and maybe kind of visually the stuff that he's making now probably looks the best it looks in a while. And I don't make me wrong. It might be because, you know, he's had, you know, 10 plus years of being able to kind of hone and kind of fine tune his creative voice, his design codes, his color palette. But from just an objective point of view, again, not being a fan of the music in general, I have to be honest, like the creative output so far from this guy on all fields from activations to videos to clothing to the shoes has been on a level that people don't probably give him the props for because again it's Kanye and people don't really like him as a person anymore but it's definitely a high level now so it's no surprise in my opinion when I listen to the live stream that this was the best sounding album I've heard from Kanye in a while like the best sounding album overall was the Kid See Ghost that he did with Kid Cardi that collaboration album but again he's doing collaboration with somebody that would type pretty well and of course the production that he did for Pusha T's album as well was top of the line right and they obviously worked in tandem Pusha T was able to push back on a few things I think he mentioned no pun intended but when he was left to his own devices to do his own album it turned out really crappy right no one really wants to say it because you know everyone wants to protect the Kanye link and the Kanye connection which is understandable but that last album the one that came out was it yeah you right? was and even St. Pablo they were horrendous right um, front to back they're very they're pretty much unlistenable as a whole project they might have a few tracks that people will bang here and there but as a Kanye West project they don't really hit the way that you would expect them to hit and again we're only measuring and comparing him to his previous work not to anybody else just what he's done himself and it didn't really come up to pass so it's no surprise that even though the first stream of Donda we heard that was played in this flipping stadium in Atlanta right sounded pretty good it's no surprise that he's fine-tuning some stuff because there were some parts in it that just didn't make any sense loads of mumbling loads of gaps in the track and obviously if you kind of think about it he was billing this as a listening party and less so as a precursor to the actual album dropping which is kind of confusing because i think 
in the general consensus around albums is that if you're doing a listening party usually that's like the the prequel to you dropping the album right it's sort of like the first thing you do for your family and friends and close collaborators and then you release it to the public so maybe that's the case but it did feel like to me he was kind of crowd sourcing the sentiment and the vibe of the stadium you know be able to feel it he's always talking about feeling and be able to vibe it out so maybe he just wanted to be out there and feel the energy of the people as they responded to certain songs what parts they loved at and all that malarkey and he kind of took a mental um, note of it and he's probably going to be applying it in the co- overall fine tuning of the album when it eventually does drop um, but this is news courtesy of Pitchfork says Kanye West's new album Donda will be released 6th of April a rep can Confirms Kanye West was moving um, his long awaited new album Donda to August 6th. A representative from West um, tells per, uh, Pitchfork media personality Justin LeBoy and West collaborator Malik Youssef posted about the August release date last week. And TMZ also previously reported on August 6th release date Donda has been slated to come out on Friday, July the 23rd via Good Music and Def Jam. The Justin LeBoy collaboration and using him as basically a PR machine has been interesting in it but also kind of a slight masterstroke in that he is obviously an incredibly corny guy who probably makes van leif probably makes four years van seem like a prophet right um somebody who i kind of actively avoid any parts of his content a complete dub he's like the west coast version of even though he's, i don't think, think he's from america but he's like a west coast version of dj academics in it incredibly corny he's all in it for the clout which is understandable but he also has built himself a platform and a name that people would kind of be it's interesting because this is no not say because he's not exactly a blog he just retweets memes and shit and makes them you know without giving people credit or whatever it may be but he's not exactly the shade room or something so you would imagine that would be a bit more of a link but i guess in terms of reality and stuff it makes sense but it's just interesting to see somebody who's demonstrably not cool in justin the boy standing next to somebody who kind of you know makes it his life mission to create cool moments right to kind of synthesize coolness and basically break it down to its core ingredients right um and stand next to somebody who clearly doesn't have any swag clearly you know is whatever um but it somehow has been able to work so credit him in that respect kind of his premier the donda during a live streaming event in Atlanta's Mercedes-Benz Stadium on July 22nd, the event streamed on Apple Music 2, and according to TMZ, it broke the Apple global live stream record with 3.3 million views tuning in to watch viewers. Again, we don't know if that's true because these places never publicly list their numbers and stuff. It's always behind the paywall because they use that to leverage other deals that they're going to get. Fair enough. But I have to be honest, it was one of the only live streams that I kind of made a note to check out apart from the verses and maybe apart from over your radio and that was back on listening to that live was always a moment because you never know he might drop a they might drop a new drake track so the good thing about kanye is that he's still able even despite everything that's happened he's probably the best at being able to create these moments these experiences around an album release like he turns it into a whole like it's, it's not even fair to call it an activation it's a whole event right that gets turned into just an album dropping and releasing um and he probably spends way more money on the of the stuff that goes around an album before it releases than you know most people spend on the tour right when that's and that's when you want to recoup money he's not really recouping money there's i think the tickets for this event were all free if i'm not mistaken right fair enough they made probably a bucket load of cash on the merch and stuff but i'm sh- pretty sure the tickets are free if i'm not mistaken and if they weren't still you know like he's like just to put that thing on to rent that mercedes-benz stadium isn't going to be cheap even if they got some sort of partnership deal so it's sort of a big play in that one he says the album played in um atlanta featured his reunion with jay-z plus collaborations with pop smoke travis scott Pusha t baby keem little little baby little dirk and others yeah the pop smoke feature is sounded phenomenal like he's one of those rappers where you really kind of have to bemoan his unfortunate demise because apart from you know put aside the contents of the lyrics but just his voice and the way he was able to kind of float on tracks especially tracks with a certain bop to them it's just phenomenal he really was gone too soon um uh and then the feature that stood out debate there was a little baby verse that was out of this world that was one of the good ones it also included no child left behind which appeared to be in a new beats um commercial starring shakari Shakari richardson the donda event also reportedly prompted the city of atlanta to proclaim july 22nd the kanye west day which is a bit corny but we get it Donda will follow 2019's our solo album Jesus King which was fairly decent for a gospel album not gonna lie on Christmas Day we're um 
where Sunday Service Choir released Jesus is Born. Ye's previous solo record, Ye, with 2018, that was a terrible one, was followed by the Kiss Seagulls and the collaboration with Kid Cudi that same year, where face and West famously co produced Tiana Taylor's and Nazir and Pusha T. So, of all of those three, only the Pusha T album was the best one. Nazir ended up scrapping. Nazir probably doesn't end up talking about Nazir album anymore because, you know, that album was terrible. And of course, Taylor, Tiana Taylor ended up leaving good music off the back of that album. In months between releasing Kid Seagulls and Jesus King, West T and eventually announced the release of an album Yandy the initial release um, date co- was confirmed as September 29th but the record never materialised Yandy then faced most uh, uh, what's that thing post-modernist test whatever and setbacks West eventually took to Twitter to say I realised a new album I've been working on this and ready yet I'll announce the release date once it's done thank you for understanding so yeah let's see man it drops when it drops maybe he's trolling us maybe he's not but in terms of sonically musically this is definitely the best stuff I've heard from Kanye in a while so I'm happy to wait for it to drop when it drops but it is interesting to see the changing in sentiment people seem to be a little bit more annoyed of him than they were previously for not releasing it because people just expect you know they've maybe fill the Kanye West gap with other rappers out there that exist um you know one example that comes to mind IDK sounds like a kind of Kanye West region people like that have basically been able to capture the imagination of the youth they drop when they say they're going to drop they seem to drop consistently and seem to drop quality music so it is one of those gonna it's going to be an uphill battle but I think in Kanye's position at the moment he probably doesn't care about that sort of thing it's just a pure artistic expressions thing and you have to rate him man do you know I mean he doesn't need the money he doesn't need the attention I don't think because he's already got loads of it in bucket and spade so much so that he goes around wearing a mask all day because he doesn't want to be seen so the fact that he still wants to enter himself into the dance and still you know contribute music and be able to provide soundtracks to people's lives and whatnot um it's quite admirable especially at his stage because you know I, there's much there'd be better things i'd be doing with my time if i was him and i had the resource that he had but again his love for music is still there and runs true so big up for him on that one Next, we have um, Rolling Loud happened over the weekend in Miami. Um, that went out off without a hitch. If you just uh, discount, you know, one of these female rappers eventually catching COVID and maybe potentially giving it to a whole host of people that attended the event. That aside, it went off pretty much without a hitch, even though I think prior there was a stage that collapsed and they had to kind of rebuild again. But um, fairly good. But one thing that was kind of evident watching the shows or watching the different sets and stuff was, number one, they do a really good job of giving each kind of performer basically maximum, I think, is like 50 minutes, 45 minutes. I think most... Um, hip-hop artists r&b artists probably can't sustain a show longer than that especially on a stage that big especially with a crowd that diverse who probably aren't all there to see the same person they're probably just there because it's a bargain you pay for rolling loud ticket anywhere between what a hundred to two hundred dollars whatever or three hundred dollars it's still worth every penny that you're going to get because you're going to divide that cost per each rapper that you like if it's five people you know, an, uh, an easy ticket to go see somebody play, even, you know, at a small venue, you're still going to pay $50. So you're still going to make, you still kind of make your money, not make your money back, but it's still going to be well worth your while going to a festival like that than it will be to go into individual shows. So they were rolling mad, rolling loud Miami, sorry, do a really good job to ensure they keep the set short, hold people's attention, of course, attention, you know, goes all over the place and it also lets the artists come and bring their a game from the jump they can't warm up or anything it's just to go straight into the hits and just smash them out smash them out smash them out one person who i forgot had many many hits was louis yvert who's featured on here rolling loud miami the 10 best things we saw right i forgot how many hit records like legitimate hit records louis he has in his catalog that came out i don't know let's say maybe more than two or three years ago right not even stuff that's like super recent stuff that come out back in his mixtape era that still rings that still goes off right and it was really cool to see the only thing that wasn't cool to see somebody like himself again the outfit was amazing head to toe and rick and i think he did the braids as maybe as an ode to exotexentacion i'm not too sure if he did but maybe he did but the only thing that was really annoying about it was the lack of performers performing with a uh, with a non-vocal backing track right and that basically means they're basically just screaming over their mp3 that you already have on your phone and i found that i don't it's weird to say i find it disrespectful but i did find it like a waste of time like why would you just go on stage to basically be the hype man of your own record and not actually perform it it didn't really make any sense and i think that mainly becomes from the side from my experience mostly comes from my kind of interest in all music and going to see bands play in indie bands and alternative acts and whatnot and for the most part the live experience is always different from what you hear on the record it's always kind of a bit more improv i think of a good example is like mac demarco 
you go see Mike DeMarco perform, no one performances are the same. He riffs and goes into different kind of, you know, bridges and stuff and goes on crazy on certain performances, adds and chops change his stuff, changes the lyrics here and there. He just provides you a different, you know, experience with, on the live performance because he knows you listen to the MP3. You don't need to have the exact experience via mp3 or if you do just sing it right without having the backing track without having the mp3 just playing as a bed because it just sounds weird because you can clearly hear these guys screaming over a track that they can obviously kind of not hear on their monitors that well and then the crowd is repeating it back to them as well it just sounds so so bizarre so that was one of the things that was a real letdown in terms of overall performances and makes you think if like is it really worth it to go to see a hip-hop person that you're into perform live like in all actuality if you think about the money spent if you think about the other abundance of acts that you could see in other genres would your money be best spent going and just trying out a different genre or going to a different festival and just seeing wagwan over there because rap shows seem a bit dead and they seem really dependent on the crowd too right because i think there's a video that went viral of like Coyle Ray performing at some place. I think even Rolling Down, she did it as well, where the crowd didn't seem that receptive, but also the crowd just seemed dead overall. And unfortunately, there's no way of kind of amping up a hip hop crowd if they don't want to be amped up. If they're just there to vibe and just kind of see you perform, they'll just see you perform. Um, but then sometimes when the acts are performing on stage, it just doesn't really seem like a show. It just seems like somebody that you recognize from you know obviously being a fan of their music standing on stage screaming over a track that's already you've got on your phone or you've got on your mp3 player it just seems like a bit of a waste of time so that was a bit disappointing to see um i would like to see a lot more artists kind of you know be able to perform without a vocal backing track i remember one of the reasons why i was told that doesn't happen more often was because when they make the tracks they don't they don't yeah i was supposed to told to put because of the turnaround and because of the you know short attention span of listeners they tend to just make tracks really quickly and they don't have time to basically um take away the vocals on the on the record itself and make a proper sort of rec a proper bed that they can use for a live performance they just tend to just go whatever they have and then by the time it's time to perform live you don't want to go back to the studio to re-engineer stuff it's going to cost you money it's going to take time so you just go with what you have and just hope if you just lower the lows on your dj flim whatever if the dj lowers the lows on the mixer lowers the highs and the mids on the mixer then hopefully it can kind of drown out some of the vocals but it doesn't really work too well i don't think so um in all actuality um got some pictures here that people took from rolling out itself you've got the baby here preparing to hit the stage his performance was pretty decent i'm gonna say he's got a lot of stage presence i'd say maybe not so the performance overall but his presence was pretty good moray sounded pretty good as well sounding live um unfortunately for him as well playing with the mp3 track at the back so it kind of took away from his talent as a vocalist itself you didn't really get to hear his range as he was performing um next picture Har jack harlow was a surprisingly good performer i'm not really the biggest fan of his music i've got to be honest i think it's all a bit one note and a bit boring but i still think as a performer he did the best because guess what no no vocal backing track he had this weird thing where he had this really interesting thing that he did where the verses were left empty so he could actually perform them live but then there'll be parts of the ad libs on the hooks that he kept like he kept in so basically i think that maybe to help him with the timing to make sure that he knows when to come in and when not to come in and his performance was awesome he did some really cool swag stuff where he kind of stepped off the stage and just walked around to kind of touch everybody that was really kind of um ego you know there's a lot of ego and bravado in that you know i'm the shit and that was a really cool moment to see he didn't even do nothing he just kind of walked around the stage wasted five ten minutes and just jumped back on and kept on performing so that was pretty awesome to see so big up jack harlow for that one he's definitely made a fan of me in that regard even though again i'm not the biggest fan of his music i thought his performance was pretty good what's the next picture here who else they've got here featured they got a picture of kodak black he was obviously a great performer it was not surprising to see him get the most love out of everybody on stage obviously being a miami native he's was it miami or florida wherever he's from but i think somewhere around there right i think people are very familiar with his music because they were singing all of his stuff back to back like and you know look i mean kodak black is you know phenomenal rapper one of the super talented super underrated but he's not got the most um you know easy on the ear rapping style so for people to know every all of his bars bar for bar was really cool to see so big up him in that regard he really smashed it brought out tory lanes as well who got a really great reception on stage all things considered with him um next one got a picture of some fans in the crowd 
Uh, we've got a picture of Rico Nasi. She did supposedly pretty well. Again, I'm not that familiar with her music, but she performed really well. But you can tell that she's probably somebody that favours live performances and did really well there. Ken the Man, I'm not really that familiar with as a rap person, rapper. Koyla Ray was an interesting one, isn't it? Koyla Ray is really an interesting in, in enigma that I think her record label need to figure out what to best do with her because quite clearly on the internet and kind of in terms of creating viral content in terms of stream she seems to be smashing it loads of loads of her records seem to rack up like millions and millions of plays on spotify she's got a lot of followers right people seem to engage and like her personality even though she can be a bit cringe but for some reason whenever she performs live on stage it doesn't seem to translate and it's interesting because i think she did a performance on jimmy kimmel was it jimmy kimmel one of those shows and she did like a live performance sort of thing when COVID was happening and obviously there's no audience members. So they did these really cool, immersive kind of produced music, live music video type things. She did some performance. I think it was a, for that song called No More Parties in LA or something, one of those songs. And it was really good. She performed it live, I think, to some extent. Maybe the track was still playing. But I thought as a show, as a performance, it was really, really incredible. And I, would, and I just imagined that that was going to be the same sort of energy that was going to be put back into her live performances but for some reason it didn't really end up happening but then also there seems to be a disconnect i'm not too sure why people just seem to just have it in once they have it in for her, but it just seems like the, whenever the crowd sees her on stage it doesn't seem to get hype and go crazy and that it can't be because of the tempo or the vibe of a song because i've seen billy eilish go on stage and you know talk about cutting herself and shit you know with music that's like 72 bpm and people are going insane over it so it's not the tempo it's just something about her that people don't seem to connect with and the, the record label needs to figure out a solution because it's a bit of a waste to have somebody really popular online and you can't translate that into live performances maybe it requires her having to go out and perform her own shows in front of her own fans and then have that footage uploaded and then have fans basically be like oh okay this is how we should be behaving i don't know if it's one of those kind of micro sort of you know nudge 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 things that way just kind of in un, kind of um subliminal things that you throw out i'm not too sure but either way she's an enigma that I don't really seem to figure out what's exactly happening there on stage because in terms of overall package she has everything i think she's got the charisma she's obviously very social media savvy in her she kind of promotes and markets herself the songs although not for me tend to kind of vibe with the current generation the melodies the way baby voices um but for some reason when she goes on stage people just don't really give a shit and i think rolling loud was a really big reminder as to why the top people are the top people and why the ones up and coming need to, a lot of work to be done um, in order to kind of get to that level because there really was a lot of um realization of what the actual levels are when it comes to performing on those sort of stages here's the next picture we've got little tj again with somebody that i didn't really listen to that well but he got a really great perform really got response sorry, from the crowd maybe because he's similar sort of age to a lot of the guys that are there watching maybe again i don't really know but people seem to really vibe with him he's an interesting one from just a visual point of view because on social media for some reason he even looks really small or really tall when he was on that stage he looked like he was like six foot three and i typed in his height on google and it told me he was five eleven five ten i don't know how tall how tall little tj is but he's um he, he's he's a confusing one in that respect visually but he got a great response from the crowd so that's all that matters in that respect um what else picture they got here then we'll quickly move on bada bing we've got a picture of ruby rose she did pretty well performance wise her Flo millie city girls were very impressive at the rolling that i thought um in terms of responses from the crowd i forgot you know how many girls actually tend to listen to a lot of girl girl rappers and whatnot it kind of goes off my head because i tend not to listen to that kind of music because you know it's just not for me but that was cool to see in that regard especially considering the amount of stick that she was getting for being featured on the xxl um list what the, of the up, up and coming artists come, whatever it may be what they call it whatever that list is that everyone seems to give a shit about that kind of went and gone didn't it this year more pictures of fans again loads of kids that was great to see having fun letting their head on after a pretty tumultuous year i don't know who that is oh that's more right there the baby was obviously created a bit of a viral moment with his comments <laughs> about homosexuality and stuff that was fairly weird don't get me wrong but again you know freedom of speech and all that let him say what he wants um i thought his performance was fairly strong he has a very good straight presence he seems that like somebody you could tell when somebody's been grinding 
like you know doing local shows performing in bars and whatnot and restaurants and you know shitty festivals because he can really perform he kind of reminds me of like an old school like a method man or a red man in terms of his prestige presence he really held those guys in the palm of his hands and obviously he's got hits for days so it was easy to run through all of them so that was awesome to see uh what else we got here come on who else is here to move on the pictures are taking ages to load you've got cash page which supposedly did really well too she got a great response somebody again who i'm not really that familiar with i just live here on features but people seem to really resonate with her on the on the stage that was awesome to see and one of the baby's dancers stretching but yeah overall a pretty decent show i was a um fan of it um little was it young fug announced the uh, release of his new album called punk that's going to be coming out soon that looks phenomenal i think that's also kind of a pre um that also kind of reson what kind of tied in with news uh, he's going to do an npr with uh travis baker travis barker sorry on the drums as well live performance is going to be pretty cool um they've got here the top 10 list of the events that they thought it was good from rolling stones they thought the best rage was travis scott he did pretty well performance wise but you know you're going to get with travis little baby was awesome freaks performance lato best set list was Megan Thee Stallion I'm not too sure about that one um the best debut was Moray again not too sure about that one sentimental Bobby Shmurda for sure there's an interesting one because most of the kids there probably don't know who Bobby Shmurda is they probably know him for the meme but there is a bit of a gap there in terms of the amount of attention he gets on social and the amount of coverage he gets in terms of a personality with the music there's not really a lot of music and since he's been released from prison we haven't really heard anything new from him allegedly that's because he's got some label issues happening that's why the music has been a bit stagnant at the moment but it was just great to see somebody who quite clearly had their whole life ahead of them was put on pause for a brief period of time because you know they got um caught up in whatever lifestyle they were in and then were able to come out at a good enough age to still enjoy the fruits of whatever labor they did forward they put forth before and i think because he went at such a pivotal moment especially such a pivotal time and people are making you know money hand over piss and hip-hop with streaming and live shows he's probably in a place now which i think i could say with no with kind of a good certainty that he probably is never going to go back to prison again like having that feeling of being on stage with your friends him wearing a i think it was like a tom brown tracksuit thing with a top and a shorts and pradas and jaws glistening and smiling and doing that dancing that he does and you know sh um mobbing out with his friends on stage like that felt like a victory that felt like a great way to kind of conclude the you know a very tumultuous year or so that he's had coming you know being all these kind of false release dates and then finally getting out so i think that was a great way to kind of cap it all off and of course young fugs all pink outfit was phenomenal to see from afar but yeah rolling loud you know very loud was pretty good it went it went okay it went off without a hitch but like i said it was maybe a great reminder a refresher that maybe going to hip-hop shows isn't necessarily worth the money that these people are charging and maybe if you are going to the show you're not exactly going because you want to see a performance you're just there because you want to see your favorite artists in the flesh kind of feel them touch them and all that malarkey it's less so about the quality of their music or the quality of performance and more so just being in their same space as them and being able to take your own pictures and maybe get a selfie you know those kind of things people want to do more so than the quality because the performances for hip-hop shows are diabolical going by what we heard on rolling loud i would say that with all certainty um next on the list we might as well just quickly jump into some football news this is courtesy of this is for my united fans specifically um fabrizio romano the king of here we go has just confirmed the other day that rafael Ra Ra rafael varan to manchester united here we go agreement almost done between my united and Real Madrid. just final details to completed and then paperwork's time it's a matter of hours or days here we go varan has total agreement of personal terms too so allegedly it's anywhere between 200 to 320 k per week he's going to sign a three-year deal he's 28 he's leaving real madrid at some will describe maybe his peak and it does on the face of it sound like a no-brainer you know may United are dying and crying out for a commanding hmm, yeah may United are dying for a commanding center back that they can partner alongside with um harry Maguire, somebody that could maybe partner him and maybe fill up his inefficiencies which maybe can do with pace and um organization what well, i'm not i'm really too sure yeah you say pace yeah pace in terms of covering and maybe kind of aggression on the front foot something no aggression on the front foot harry mcguire has got definitely pace that can maybe kind of compensate for his lack of movement and lack of pace and rafa Varane seems like the best option on the market at the moment
moment um there's that guy at leo at the moment what's his name is he botman or something is it botman botman i think the center back there's not that many kind of high profile center backs out there um who you know who people actually want who people actually think can kind of come in at top level clubs and kind of hit the ground running it seems like center defenders for the most part in terms of competitive ones like the john terry's at the sergio ramos are, are like a dying breed we don't even have you know like an amania vidges type defenders anymore they don't really exist in the modern game for whatever reason so referan is probably the best available on the market now at the moment the only concern i'd have is that a player from Real Madrid coming to United at this time just feels a bit strange. It doesn't seem like something that should make sense, especially when you consider May United aren't necessarily closer to winning the Champions League or the Premier League anytime soon. I don't think so. And that mostly has to do with the manager and the coaching staff overall and not to do with the players. I still think the players, even with the addition, I still think regardless of Sancho and Varane, I still think that team as is could challenge a lot better for titles for cups than they have done in previous seasons and the reason why we haven't done that and you know as evidence with the Villarreal final in Europa League has to do with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer so it's an interesting thing that we're doing now because I was also one of the people because it's twofold it's a weird argument to make on one point I think the players aren't as bad as everyone think they are but I also don't think that people take into account how bad Solskjaer is as a manager. But then on the other extent, I also believe that if the club truly believe that Solskjaer is a the guy, they have to give him all the tools necessary for him to succeed the job. And he quite clearly has shown us that he can't coach the team to play good football right um, he can't get the best out of a bad bunch he has to kind of have the best players because there's other teams in the league who have far let's say worse players than us players that we wouldn't swap in our team for theirs the Aston Villas the Brightons but they play way better football than us Leicester City are a good example right there's not many players in the team overall would swap I think the whole entire back line would keep so maybe the goalkeeper we might change maybe a couple of midfielders not the striker Jeremy you know I mean? so we definitely have better players than these teams but we don't play better football so if that's the case the only other way to kind of solve that conundrum and get us winning trophies is to give the manager more money and allow him to buy the players that he thinks can hit the ground running and just kind of win stuff straight away which is interesting because it's kind of similar to like the Mourinho approach right he doesn't really care about the youth he doesn't really do all that stuff he just wants to win and win now have proven winners people from ages 25 and up who've been there done that and got the t-shirt so that's one side of things the other side of things obviously is the Varane side where it's like would the should we be worried that a player is going from Real Madrid to United at this stage when he could have just stayed at Real Madrid and collected his wage or he could have gone to another club, maybe not as earned as much, but still had the possibility of winning competitions? Um, I'm not too sure. Um, acclimatizing again to the Premier League is a whole different affair. The challenges in the like, for as much as I think people in general probably overrate the Premier League especially English football pundits they tend to kind of go on and on and on about the Premier League and don't tend to give any sort of credence to what happens in Europe I still think in terms of variety of tactics and opponents and kind of physicality and whatnot and demands on the player you're probably going to be tested way more playing the Premier League week in week out than you would do in other leagues obviously overall in terms of technical ability and footballing proficiency and stuff other leagues kind of you know far um, do a far better job of providing a far better product or maybe far better technical gifted players and whatnot than the Premier League but you know Every game in the Premier League is a big game, right? There's no game un until we get to the end of the season where the places are basically didn't decided is you're gonna give you're not gonna get a gimme. There are no such games as like Getafe or Celta Vigo away. They don't exist. Every team's gonna bring it. So Rafa Varane's gonna have to hit the ground running at the age of 28, playing against strikers who are quite honestly going to be out to get him because they're going to want to make a name for themselves it's going to be an interesting thing to see because even with the addition of harry Maguire and uh you know what's his name and uh aaron wan you know harry Maguire record signing um aaron wan at the time record signing for right back we still were conceding a lot of goals so it just makes me think that maybe the players individually were the problem maybe how we defend is a problem and still we don't have a defensive midfielder we haven't signed yet pogba might leave so it's just a lot of questions around it but i think in general if the club really believes social as a guy they have to give him the players necessary in order to kind of make it make sense and if the referee van is one of the final jigsaws and so be it but i've kind of reiterated a lot of times on social with the signing of referee of Rand, expectations have jumped up i don't want to hear any 
Ollie Inners, any Ollie sexuals as they kind of kindly refer to, make any excuses for Ollie Gunnar Solskjaer going forward now. He has to win a trophy next season. He has to. He simply must. There are no excuses. He's gotten all the players he wants, maybe it, with the exception of maybe another strike on a DM, but he's got basically half of his needs. Somebody he's been chasing for ages in Sancho, and obviously a commanding centre back to kind of. Um, basically help Harry Maguire even though Harry Maguire was signed as meant to be the transformative centre back like Virgil van Dijk he was meant to be the one that was meant to be the final piece in the jigsaw in the defence but as we've seen Harry Maguire still got his deficiencies so now we have to sign another centre back to kind of make Harry Maguire look good and now hopefully with that defensive lineup, we've got the supposedly the best left back in the world in Luke Shaw we've got Harry Maguire that everyone in, in May United seems to rate as one of the best centre backs I don't necessarily think that's true but for everyone everyone's kind of licking the lips over because he played for a team that was very successful and he was obviously a big part in that and Aaron wan a lot of people think is under rated and deserved in this country and should be playing for England so of the four we've still got three top top quality defenders so we should be able to have a good base to kind of build from you would hope so but if that that's not the case and social doesn't end up winning anything then his job should definitely come into question i think with the on the off the back of this signing so great overall i'm still kind of dubious like i said coming from the liga at this age you know with his kind of profile whether it's going to work out he's lost a bit of pace but he's still obviously relatively super quick um obviously this probably spells the end for the likes of lindelof and Bailly, but you know who cares about them then moving on, we have news here, finally confirmed news. That's probably the worst kept secret in the history of football. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer signs a new contract United until 2024. Personally, I'm not a fan of it. Um, I don't necessarily think I agree with everybody else that's saying it's rewarding mediocrity. I don't think that's true. I think he's done a good job. You can't deny that. He's obviously stabilised the club. He's obviously been able to somehow take, you know, get out all the dead wood, quote unquote keep the players that he wanted he's built a harmonious atmosphere everyone seems to be enjoying playing for him and the club a lot more fans seem to be a lot more um have a lot more time for the players and i think prior managers especially under Mourinho, a lot of the fans had a lot of a hate towards some of the players but we seem to like them a lot more and we obviously in terms of points in terms of position no, in terms of position we are cl obviously closer um to winning trophies than we were with previous coaches but we actually did win trophies with previous coaches so it's a kind of a two-fold thing i just think in terms of a coach he's obviously not in demand i don't think Oli Solskjaer was commanding the interest of various clubs in europe so i don't really see the rush in giving the contract now even if it's a last year but if you know anything about man united whenever someone's got a last year in a contract they always offer them a new deal because they don't want to lose anybody for free or be made to look like fools, quote unquote. So they might rather just give you a new contract and just, you know, figure it out later. A good example is One Matter. A good example is Bayi recently. A good example is, um, what's his name? One Matter, Bayi. Henderson and De Gea may be a good example in terms of their contract renewals. We do a lot of weird contract renewals that don't really make sense. So in my ideal world, I would prefer it if we waited until Christmas. If we were really. If we started the season really well and we were kind of in and around the title challenge second third with a couple of points be between us between first giving him a new contract would have been great for morale overall yeah we're going in the right direction here's a reward boom or even at the end of the season if we end up winning a trophy that'd be a great way to cap it and no one could really deny it but kind of announcing a contract now when he hasn't won jack shit and quite clearly a lot of fans a lot of football people in general think that he's still not going to win jack shit even with the players available it makes me think that we're going to be in a position where if we end it, if we do end up starting off poorly, we're going to be in a position where we're going to have to just keep him because we've signed him onto a contract for three and a half years. But obviously contracts in football don't mean much, bloody blah, 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 blah. I'm not too sure, but still, I'm kind of not really for it overall. But the story on, the, my, my, on Sky Sports says the following. May Night Manager... Sorry, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has signed a new contract with the club until 2024 with the option of a further year. Former club striker Solskjaer initially stepped in as caretaker boss in 2018 um, after replacing Mourinho. After leading United to 14 wins in 19 matches, he was awarded a three-year contract, which is obviously was a bad move in that respect, which is set to expire in 2021 season. Solskjaer led the club to a third-place Premier League finish in his first full season in charge. United finished second in the table last season and also reached the final of the Europa League, where they were beaten by a penalty by the Liga side of Villarreal. So still no trophy. Oli said, United are hungry for success. Social has spent 11 season. United as a player said, everyone knows the feeling I for this club and I'm delighted to have signed this new contract. It's an exciting time for Man United. We've built the squad with a good balance of youth and experience and players that are hungry for success. The only interesting part about this is really weird. I think someone mentioned, I think um, 
what was it mentioned? I forgot. I think it might be Duncan Castles. There is a real lack of kind of like specific dates and deadlines and goals in mind of trophies, right? No one's talking about it. Everyone's just talking about building and heading to the right direction. When you look at every other club around the world, when it comes to creating results, they just kind of will it into existence, right? They either implement or kind of hire the right people to structure it in a way, or they just get the best coaches and the best managers and align them and hope that they can kind of figure it out. A good example is Thomas Tuchel, right? Um, Lampard was talking about Chelsea not being title defenders or not being title challengers um, in his first full season there and then w within a space of six or so months you know Tuchel had Chelsea kind of competing for the league and also finishing third and also end up winning the Champions League so quite clearly managers do have a big influence and obviously having the great structure and the great players um, in order of the overall team success but he came in automatic and said hey if I don't achieve results and get trophies I know I'm going to get sacked we all know what Chelsea's game is but United seem to be under the impression that this approach of like giving Solskjaer time giving him giving him unlimited time and just willing and hoping that it kind of works itself out in the future is going to work and I'm not necessarily sure that's true there's just too many good managers in the league at the moment for me to really believe that just signing Varane and Sancho and maybe another player is somehow going to get us finishing above the likes of Chelsea, Man City, Liverpool consistently, obviously to win the league. Finish the second, I don't really care about people. Because, oh yeah, we finished ahead of them last season, but f to finish ahead of them to win the league and to beat them in big matches to f win trophies and stuff, I just don't see it happening because once when it comes down to it, you know, Solskjaer has kind of failed, you know, at, in all occasions when he has come down to it. A lot of the players obviously have failed too, but it just seems odd that there's no real date, no real timeline set out. It's just all kind of lofty vagueness. He continues to say, I have a fantastic coaching team around me. No, you don't. And we're all ready to take the next step of our journey. May I react uh, wants to be winning the biggest and best trophies. And that's what we're striving for. We have improved both and often on the pitch. And that will continue over the coming seasons. I can't wait to get out in front of the packed Old Trafford and get this campaign started. He's always talking about the packed stadiums and the crowds and the lack of home fans. I don't know, man. We don't really talk about the football, our style of play, how it's involving. Nothing. It's just always about vibes and atmosphere. Weird. Ed Woodward, for some reason, who's still there, even though he said he's going to leave, he's still making comments. He said Oli and his staff had worked tirelessly, putting the foundations in place, long-term success. The results of that have become increasingly visible over the past two seasons. But yeah, blah, 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 blah. He's got his new deal. Um, again, more pressure has been mounted on him, I think. Expectations should be high. If he doesn't win a trophy next season, his future should be in jeopardy, as all big club managers are. I think all the Oli inners who are kind of oblivious to that are kind of weird because they seem to have more love for the manager them for the manager himself than the overall club but you know that goes without saying hopefully he wins something because i want to see may not be successful but if he doesn't no sentiment involved get rid and get someone else that can do the job but again we move we move what else is going to talk about mm -hmm. this i talk about rolling loud i mentioned that Ba, 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 ba. What else is here? Oh, let's go talk about this one. Here. Let's talk about this. Have you seen this? For some reason, I don't know why, but Joe Rogan's been posting these really weird videos on his Instagram stories lately. He's obviously talking about taking pictures of Mars and the moon with his Samsung Galaxy. He was shilling for Chevrolet on the Tim Dillon. When Tim Dillon appeared on the show recently, he did that weird McDonald's tie-in with one fan fight companion. And now he's been filming these weird things where he's been talking about being in a what in a sauna and also being um, doing ice cold baths and filming it and recording himself how long he's been there. It's been bizarre, but he has this weird thing where he kind of feels like if he keeps pushing himself and doing things that are kind of really difficult, despite him obviously being somebody that has a lot of wealth, has a lot of kind of resources, access, network, bloody blah, 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 to just live a comfortable life, that it somehow keeps him grounded. And it's quite admirable because, again, as, as a fan of his, he's definitely one of the least douchebaggy multi multi millionaires that exist right definitely has to be up there like he doesn't necessarily give you rich douchebag energy he can kind of be a little bit um he can kind of be a little bit you know oblivious to the life of an average american out there or average human being but that's you know that makes complete sense considering he's been a multi-millionaire for the majority of his life mostly would you say majority maybe from the 30s on wood he's kind of been able to command a pretty good salary and wage for himself and obviously with the back of the podcast he's built a substantial amount of wealth and especially off the back of the spotify deal so if him doing these cold baths is a good indicate is a way for him to kind of keep himself humble then fair play but it is bizarre to see some 
somebody of his age doing such a thing and it's even more bizarre when you get these really funny screen caps like this one where he's got rogan's got these amazingly protruding nipples that look like flipping pinky fingers right just dangling out of his chest and for some reason his head looks even more bigger than what it usually does supposedly this is some consequence of being you know the, of being on a cocktail of steroids that he's allegedly well not allegedly because he does say he's on them but the cocktail of steroids that he supposedly takes all the time that's probably a consequence of it right this massive head i think um dana white um the president of the ufc has the same sort of thing where his head's always consistently red even though he's supremely jack he's got this weird kind of massive bulbous flubby head and rogan seems to have the same thing but these nips are just on another level fair enough it might be because of the cold but i've been i've been informed by some of my um with some of my gay friends that this is usually a telltale sign that somebody's into bdsm sort of nipple play sort of stuff right where you kind of have clamps attached to your nips and then those clamps have like weights or whatever it may be called and you get some sort of sexual satisfaction from all that sort of stuff allegedly this is a telltale sign of it or somebody that likes to have their nipples play with and they're you know in the bedroom who knows but it's just so weird it really is to see a 50 year old man doing stuff like this but again it's one of those weird things that if, if this is what keeps him humble and keeps him being the way he is then i don't really have a problem with it because he's one of the only people that i know who has a hundred million dollars supposedly sitting in an account somewhere and he seems to be the same guy he hasn't really changed that much he's not suddenly wearing you know diamond rings and big chains and shit he hasn't necessarily bought a gold helicopter he just seems the completely same guy um judging by the pictures we've seen of his house that he moved into in austin it seems fairly kind of you know modest considering his level of wealth and stuff he seems to be operating and moving just like a regular dude which is again super admirable but these sort of pictures these sort of screen caps are just utterly utterly bizarre i really really do not understand them in the slightest but you know when you're maybe when you're that rich and you're you know and you're his age and you kind of feel like you still have a lot of life to live you just get bored in the house not much to do he's not really into playing video games and stuff he's that he's you know he's got hobbies that he kind of has exhausted what more can you do than you know do these kind of live impromptu instagram story challenges in a kind of tim ferris kind of fashion hopefully um spanning more sponsorship deals right i'm sure he's got a brand deal with whoever supplied that cold bath um you know i don't know i don't know but it's just, it's just interesting to see from the yes, i'm looking in so big up joe rogan on that extent what else we have here we have this interesting video courtesy of Ari Shafir's Instagram page where towards the end of his appearance on the Joe Rogan experience, he spoke pretty eloquently and pretty um, emphatically about some of his friends, three particular um, stand-ups who he feels like are overlooked in the industry and used his, you know, platform and his time that he had on Joe Rogan to basically give them a shout out and it got me thinking a lot about the videos I've, I've made about Brendan and Brian Callan and a few other people who have kind of done some faux pas over the years I'm a fan of stand-up I watch a lot of stand-up specials but I don't necessarily talk about the ones I like and one of my kind of gripes when I look at you know when I'm obviously checking out channels like The Court Ring or channels like um nerd rotic or channels like geeks and gamers which i'm really a big fan of because they call out a lot of the hypocrisy happening in hollywood and um, and whatnot the one thing that i don't really like about them is that sometimes you feel as if like they don't really tell you the stuff that they really enjoy unless you watch the live streams if you watch the friday night's tights they kind of you know enthusiastically talk about stuff they like but in terms of their videos they produce on a daily basis maybe because it's the algorithm you probably get more hits and views i would imagine if i made a video talking about my favorite stand -up specials that i watched this year i'll probably get less views on those than i would do if i made a video about brendan shorb's latest faux pas right <clears throat> but watching this clip of irish if on the Joe Rogan experience made me think that maybe I should focus my attention on putting a light on people that I like even if it's you know insequential and it's not really you know it's not really going to move the needle a couple of hundred views or whatnot it's still some attention that they probably should need to get on their career in order to help the algorithm and obviously to help inform the decisions for clubs and stuff to hire them because it's not really a question about whether or not they're good or not it's more so a question about are people talking about them and i think Ari Shafir knows that and he went to use the opportunity to get people to kind of talk about them he basically implored the fans to go out and call local clubs in order to get the people booked and i think that's something i'm gonna take um on for myself and try to promote and shout out a lot of stuff that i like i tend to do it a lot anyway but when it comes to the comedy side i do tend 
tend to focus a lot on the negativity of the stuff that's happening that can get a little bit boring you know there's only so much time you can talk about people's you know um supposed um indiscretions without it becoming a little bit trite with trite whatever that term is so let's quickly play the video here of Arash Shafir talking on Joe Rogan about his friends um Adrian Lapa, Lapa, Lapalucci, Sean Patton and Mike Vecchione there are three comedians in New York that are uh ma- their names are Adrian Apolucci, Mike Vecchione, and Sean Patton. For whatever reason, they have slipped through the cracks. And they don't make the money they should, and they're not booked as much as they should. But I am telling you, as someone who cares about stand-up comedy, that they are great. Adrian opened for me on my whole last tour. She's now on the road this weekend with, with fucking Louis C.K. Um, she had the number one joke of 2019, a Parkland joke. The day after... Um, they cut it from Netflix because whatever. But um, you want to see it? I put her album up on my YouTube page. Um, Baby Skeletons is her album. She's great. Sean Patton, you might know from um, This Is Not Happening stories, the Cuban story, the, the fake gay fashion. Um, Adrian's awesome. Uh, and Mike Vecchio, who's one of the best joke writers in New York. He is someone who makes us all better joke writers by watching him. Consistently crushes, doesn't have the networking skills to get ahead so if i just tell you i thought this out dude if i just tell you they're great you might look them up here's what i'm asking you to do the listeners and the watchers of joe rogan podcast i want you to call your comedy clubs your local comedy clubs and i want you to tell them because they're not going to book them just based on a recommendation i want you to tell them i will give you my email address and you can use it only if adrian appalucci sean patton or Mike Vecchione are playing in your city. And I think that's completely admirable. I won't play the whole thing. You will check it out for yourself. But definitely big up Irish Shafir for that one. Um, a lot of people have some bad things to say about him. He does seem to divide opinion, which is probably the best um, trait any kind of artist can basically have. But in terms of supporting his friends and being a real student of the game and being a lover of the craft, um, he does seem to be one of those... Um, rare pure souls in that respect he kind of goes out of his way to always kind of speak about comics that he likes he's one to bring up he's kind of like similar to Burton in that respect you know as annoying they are as personalities they do really love stand up and they do go out their way to mention people's bits to you know watch people's specials recommend stuff people to watch so for sure if he's shouting those guys out they're definitely going to be people that we will be fans of so definitely check them out if you're that way inclined but for me myself I've definitely seen that as a call to action to be a little bit more vociferous in terms of my praise of people that I really enjoy their content instead of talking about the latest scandal Brendan Shaw, Brian Callan and Chris Leo got themselves involved in because that can get boring after a while so that's my um, action that I'm going to take off the back of that so hopefully you will do the same in whatever guys that you want and then to end I think we're going to talk about this which is an interview which came out a while ago a couple of weeks ago with Khabib um, Namagamedov on ESPN and, and he was talking about Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier 3. He had some very not um, kind words to say about Conor McGregor. Um, he was obviously bigging up his guy, Islam. And he said something very interesting towards right at the end of the actual interview itself, where he spoke about um, how he basically, you know, helps his fighters and people that he basically wants to train and mentor and stuff. And he mentioned how in MMA or UFC you have to be really honest with people that you're working with and training because you know the fight game isn't a game I think he basically says it's not some sport you can just play it's life and death so if somebody definitely doesn't have the chops for it doesn't have the mentality doesn't have the talent or maybe it's too old I think he's mentioned age a lot he's very black and white which is why I probably like sports a lot so much because there is no kind of debate and stuff the numbers are the numbers the eye test is the eye test there is no you know gaming the system there is no licking of Passes. there is no kind of networking your way to the top you have to kind of at one point or the other you can obviously get your foot in the door by being somebody's friends and panning up to certain people but when it push comes to shove you really have to deliver you're only there on your own right and you're going to be exposed one way or the other so i like black i like sports that way because it's very very black and white and he mentions a lot of age he mentions a lot of experience talent all this sort of stuff and he basically mentions if some of his fighters he feels i don't have it he kind of encourages them to pursue other things because obviously the fight game is very brutal and it made me think of creative pursuits specifically one guy in person who i'm um friends with who i saw a clip of him performing somewhere and it sounded shockingly bad um it didn't really sound like he improved from all the years i've seen him perform in other places and it made me think like 
are his friends doing him a disservice by not telling him to maybe pursue other things because he's clearly not talented at what he's doing he's not good at it it's just is you know um demonstrably not demonstrably true it's just evidently true but if you just listen to his music it just sounds horrendous he's performing live at some show are his friends doing him a disservice by not being honest and telling him hey stop that and do something else or especially considering we've been under a lockdown and people haven't been able to pursue their creative kind of hobbies and stuff that they want to do should anybody be in a position to tell somebody not to do something that they enjoy even if it's not gonna take them anywhere because you know when i always mention on this show a lot as adults it's really difficult to have hobbies you don't really get them right hobbies don't really exist for adults you kind of just end up having a couple of things that you do but you don't really have stuff that you do outside of maybe hanging out with your friends so if you have something that can maybe allow you to travel the world allow you to travel the country go to different places see different faces keep the fire burning inside of you who's to tell you you should stop but then again maybe are you wasting your time i don't know let's play the clip and you hear what could be best to say and then we can carry on on the other side before his son can finish like 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 i have guys in my team i give them advice you guys like like when i see someone he don't have fire He's like age, like I just tell him, hey, you, you, it's gonna be better if you find other job. And I try to help him, like give him like some job, make him busy, make him money, like you know, like just do, just don't tell me, like just leave this sport. No, we have to make him busy, do something like in other, like uh, you know, like things, because in this sport you have to be very hungry. Or other way, like someone gonna come and hurt you when you have family, kids, when you have all life ahead you know it's like uh, this is this is not easy like look what happened with Connor, you know his kids watch like his family watch look what happened with like chris weidman or like anderson silva like not only these guys who broke legs like other guys who have damage on their bra brain you know how many guys they still compete knock out knock out knock out knock out this is change your mind change your brain like this is give you very like uh, they make you like different person because of too much you and he's right right he's completely right in what he says but for some reason we don't seem to have the same level of like black and whiteness in terms of creative pursuits and again i'm not too sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing because part of me thinks you know he said he likes to tell his, you know, tell his fighters if they not, haven't got the chance for it, I'll find you something else to keep yourself busy because quite clearly if those guys are in those gyms and trying to make some money it's because they don't really have anything else going for them, right? They feel as if this is the only one option that they have to kind of come out of whatever situation that they're in. They're blessed with these physical attributes. They're big, they're strong. Maybe they've got a hell of a chin on them. They think, you know what, let me go to the UFC and I can maybe make some money that way. But obviously at the level that MMA is at the, at the moment, you just can't be a big, strong guy and get away with it. You have to be skilled, right? Because people are basically practicing and training at this sport like it's any other sport. They're doing it every single day. They've been doing it since they're young. It's just impossible to kind of, you know, uh, make up that skill and knowledge gap just through pure, you know, physical attributes alone. It's just not going to happen. So he finds some other things to do, but that's the key thing. He's trying to find some other things because it's important to keep them busy because he knows people with those kind of physical attributes, with that kind of temperament to be in an octagon to knock people out and shit, you know, you you need to keep those people busy. You can't have somebody that big with that kind of level of regression just sitting the idle. They need to be, they need to be fit. They need to feel of use. And of course, maybe it comes because of the society he's from, being a man, you have to feel like you're providing for the family, blah, 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 blah. Forget that. But there doesn't need to be said it does need to be something that needs to be spoken about a lot more in the creative fields where people need to be maybe told or informed that maybe the, what you're pursuing isn't necessarily something that can ever become a career but then you feel like where who are you to tell that person this thing because you just never know there are so many stories of people who are unlikely successes but then you know some people would argue that those people are anomalies i'm not really too sure what the real kind of solution is there but it would be great if people maybe had a mixture of friends in their social group there you had somebody who could be the eternal dreamer right we've all got that person in our crew i know people who are like this who are still making music now right trying to be rappers and singers and stuff and you clearly know it's not going to happen but then you also need people in your crew that are 
realists who can tell you hey man you're 32 you don't have kids you don't have a family and stuff that can give you that kind of balance but unfortunately it feels like people are either kind of maybe it's because of human nature we tend to maybe attract people who we want to be in our lives so if we want kind of people that are going to gas us up and give us um, false hope then we're going to surround ourselves with these people and the moment someone comes around and tries to be real we kind of cut them out and move on to somebody else I'm not really too sure of the solution but when I did that video of my friend performing and singing completely out of tone and sounding completely horrendous I was just thinking to myself shit man and like still all these years he still hasn't improved he's still not good at what he does and it's just a shame because he quite clearly is passionate about what he does he quite clearly wants it to happen but you can't exactly will yourself into becoming a star or becoming successful it doesn't really i don't think it happens that way it's either you have it or you don't and for some reason sports is easily there's an easy measure of that for you just your talents and be able to kick a ball catch a ball hold a stick right there's something that you can gauge where you're at but in terms of creative pursuits unless it you know you're talking about our actual singers when it comes to artistry like you know dj is a good example like myself there's no real way to discern between why a person is playing on a big festival stage somewhere in the middle of barcelona and why the person playing in the pub for 50 dollars isn't playing on that stage there's no real rhyme or reason why right it's just because it is what it is maybe because that person made a track you don't really know but in terms of skill level they're probably on the same sort of playing field so it's difficult to tell pub guy to stop aiming for the festival stage because festival stage guy was the pub guy once in the lifetime as well so it's kind of too far i'm not really too sure what you said but let me know what you think if you have friends that are in the creative arts and are still trying to become singers at you know ungodly ages who quite clearly you think maybe aren't that good who have maybe tried to open 17 shopify businesses that have all failed but they keep on trying and they keep putting entrepreneur in their title of their bio of their instagram do you have to do you feel like you have to tell them that they suck or do you think the world is just going to inform them for them what do you think i'd love to know what you think in the comments down below i would love to know what you think <clears throat> Anyway, I think that's basically it. I've been chewing it off for too long. It's been an hour of the Excellent Zinger Show. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. You know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, a five-star review and a share will help the show go a long way. And of course, if you want to support the show via Patreon, please do. They've got bonus episodes on there now at the moment that I'm doing every weekend. So jump on board where I talk about more racy subjects. I was talking about some of my you know reviews for my post-lockdown first DJ gig. That's fairly detailed and extensive. So if you want to hear the drunken ramblings of some that just played their first DJ gig to definitely check out my Patreon app. You can find the description in the, in the you can find the link in the description, sorry, and the link is Axino Zinger. Um, no, sorry, the link is patreon.com for So definitely check that out. I'll be much appreciated if you do. And until next time, I'll see you again. Take care, be safe, peace.